Oh, good morning, good morning. Why don't you raise your hands and squeeze your fingers? It'll help the circulation in your bottom. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> 22 years ago, I received a phone call while I was living in uh, Sedona, Arizona. And the call was from a woman in Slovakia who said, we have just been faced with the challenge of what do we do about education now that the wall is down. So I said, well, why don't I come and see what you have? And after I see what you have, I will see if there's something I can offer. When I came, it was very scary. I went in classrooms where it was da, 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 da. The teacher was very loud, loud, loud. It's like, oh my gosh, it was very scary. And at recess time, the children would run in the hallways and make all kinds of noise. And I thought, oh, this is a big project. This is a big project. By that time, I had already spent 30 years studying how the human brain learned. And so today what I'm going to share with you is knowing what we know about the brain and knowing what we know about children, what can we possibly do in the era of Google? Okay, wait just a minute, I'll check. Uh-huh, yeah, just a minute, I have a phone call. Uh-huh, yes. Uh, ju just a minute. The idea is, is regardless of what you decide, this will rule the lives of the children. You can make great decisions, but they will respond to this. And our goal is to teach them how to come together with this information and do something that's constructive. So that's my goal today, is to share with you some ideas. Did you ever wonder that we are the only species that creates the environment that creates what we become. You live in the rural, you become rural. You live in the city, you become city. You live under communism, you become communist. You live under freedom, you become free. We create the environment, and in that environment, we bloom or not bloom. When you walk into an ITV school, you will see happy children, calm children, teachers with a calm voice, and the reality is, is the brain works better when it doesn't have threat. The brain works better when it doesn't have threat. So creating that environment is critical. It's critical that the, that the director understand this because everything starts at, with the director's attitude. So we have this, and here's what we're up against. One million apps. One million apps. They don't need us. The students do not need us. And the interesting thing about the computer is the computer is very brain compatible. The computer doesn't dictate. It doesn't yell. It doesn't say wrong. It says do over. The computer provides total uh, opportunities for the student to go as far as they want to go. That's huge. They don't have to ask for permission with the computer. So when we look at one million apps and they're going more and more each day, the reality is what can you do in your school and in your classroom to prepare citizens in a successful community? That's the challenge. Now, I was here since 1991. That's 22 years. I'd like to say that I was younger then. I think I was, but I even had white hair then. And I remember asking at a conference to my translator, why do I not see white hair in Slovakia women? And she asked the audience, and everybody giggled. <laughs> and they say, we go to the beauty parlor and color it. So I thought that was, I learned something that day. The challenge is, what are we going to do with this? So I'm going to give you a little test right now, a little opportunity to check your intelligence. If I were magic 
and could give you one more visual eye, where would you put the eye? I would give you an eye, so you now have three. I want you to think seriously about where you would put the eye. I'm going to give you two minutes to think, and then I'm going to want you to talk to your neighbor. So right now, where would you put a third eye? Talk to your, think about it, and then talk to your neighbor. many would put the eye behind their head? Behind your head. If you would put your eye there, raise your hand. Okay. How many would put the eye on top of the head? No on top of the head. On top of the head. Where were some other places you would put your eye? The mayor. The mayor and I. Oh, she told you. Okay. Okay. She helps you. Here's the challenge. What you want in this generation of children is not the same answers. The same answers are obvious. Oh, I'd put it on the back of my head. I'd put it on the top of my head. The other kind of answers, I'd put it in my finger. Like I could, I could stand here and I could be watching everybody in the room with my finger. I could be looking behind. I, I could check my ear. So what we want children to do is to think beyond the obvious. Think beyond the obvious. We used to say think outside the box. But today you need, you need, I need children who can think about a future that will include adults. So think beyond the obvious about your third eye. <clears throat> Here's something that's very, very fascinating. You are not born intelligent. You are not born intelligent. Remember the children in Romania and the orphanages that just were in the cribs? Do you remember those children? You are not born intelligent. You are born with a capacity to be intelligent. A capacity. You're born, and here it is, waiting. It's waiting for all that it can gather, first and foremost, from its parents. First and foremost, it models everything the parents do. So a new baby, how many of you have seen a new baby who when you stick out your tongue, what does the baby do? If you stick out your tongue, what does the baby do? Same thing. They don't even know they have a tongue. Think about that. They model what they see. And what happens in the households becomes who they are 80% of the time. So in a household, if people are smoking, 80% of the children will smoke. If in a household, if people are drinking alcohol, 80% of the children will drink. We are born to model after what we see. That's huge. Now here's the real challenge. You have some choices every single day, three choices. You can enhance, make bigger, your mental capacity. You could, you could grow your capacity. You could add to your social and intellectual capacity. You could stifle your capacity. Understand stifle, which just means the nothing. Sometimes we hear teachers say, oh, you know, they're lazy. Well, they're stifling their capacity because every single moment your brain changes. Physiologically, it changes. So you could, you could enhance, you could stifle, or you could diminish. Diminish means you're slowing your capacity down and you cannot function. You cannot function. So 
every day as a teacher, you have to say when the children leave your classroom, did I enhance their capacity to be big thinkers? Did I enhance their capacity to work cooperatively? Did I enhance their capacity to think about what they can do for their country? Because those are the kinds of people we need to become the mayor, to become the minister of education, to become the president, people who can think. And know where they'll put their third eye. So here we go then with how do we make that happen in this age of technology. Thank you. See, as an Italian, I could never be an astronaut. Because I forget where I put things. And we would be off in some other place. Okay. So here it is. You can, not only your intellectual capacity, only, not only your intellectual capacity, but your social and emotional capacity. Let me ask you how you behave in the home of your in-laws. How you behave in the home of your in-laws. How you behave when you're out with your sport team. How you behave when you're in the faculty room. You will notice that every time you change your group, you change behavior. You change behavior. Now, I am very lucky. I have Czechoslovakian in-laws. My father-in-law was from um, Slovakia. My mother-in-law was from Prague. And so I have uh, a Slovakian husband who taught me the most important thing I should know. Daimi Pusu. Give me a kiss. It was the best. I thought that's, he also, I also learned how to ask to go to the bathroom. Yamazim Nazako. So, and Puchke. So that is my Slovakian. But the reality is, is that the things our parents do, we become them. Or we do diabetically opposite. So you and I have these incredible choices. We have incredible choices. And those choices show us that inside the brain, even as we are sitting here today, it is changing. And if you get lucky enough to get old, you know it's changing because you think, what? I forgot that. What was that? I don't remember that. Because your brain is so busy collecting new information, it sometimes loses information. We call it a senior moment. A senior moment. So here's the brain. Now look at when a baby is born at six months, how many how many connections they have. But notice at 14, they have fewer connections. Here's the scary part, this is scary now, about the computer. Here's the scary part about Google. What happens is if you don't use all of those connections, they disappear. They atrophy, they die, they, they dry up. And that's very much like my family raised sheep. And when the, when the sheep were born, we took a rubber band and we put it around the tail of the sheep and we put it around the testicles of the male sheep. And in three weeks, the tail would drop off and the testicles would drop off. So let me tell you about Google. Google would you hold this so I could use my hands? Thank you. Okay. He's my help. You could be my help. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in Google, in Google, they have GPS. GPS. How many of you know use GPS? Okay. So what happens is that in your hand, I don't want to be right in the light. Thank you. In your hand, look at your hand. Look at your hand. And look at all the lines in your hand. All right. Remember, if I put a rubber band on the tail of the sheep, what does it do? What does it do? Say it out loud. You can say it in Czech, Slova. Okay, don't say it. Uh, <laughs> it falls off. Once you start to use GPS, all of a sudden, this stops. So the things you no longer use, these brain cells stop connecting. And you'll find yourself one day saying, I, I don't know how to do that. I have to ask Google. I don't know how to do that. I have to ask YouTube. Have you ever wondered what happens if the, the electrical grid around the world goes away? We'll all be very, very much like the lamb, impotent. 
So it's very important to know that if you give your brain to this, if you give this, you are losing something. Doesn't mean this can't help, but are you willing to give your brain to this? Ask your neighbor. Thank you. Ask your neighbor that question. One other thing about the computer and your iPhone. It is addictive. It is addictive. If you tell your boys you can be your games for just one hour, it's not one hour, it's two, it's three, it's four. If you tell your girls you could be on Facebook for 20 minutes, it's one hour, two hours, three hours, it's in the middle of the night. It is addictive. The brain goes, oh boy, we get to play. Oh boy, we get to play. So knowing that, what can we do in our classrooms to take what we know about the brain and, and form and encourage and build students who see that there's magic in what we're doing? That's the case. So we talk about creating the conditions for learning. Creating the conditions for learning. The first condition, and you heard the children say that they're happy in their school, you have to have an absence of threat in order for the brain to work best. Because if you're threatened, your whole body is tense, and it holds the information, and you don't move. I'll show you a picture in a few minutes that show that. You don't move, you're afraid. So you have to have an absence of threat, and you have to be able to reflect about what you're doing. It's not about the right answer. It's about thinking. How do, you, how do you grade thinking? Oh, I just heard somebody's phone. Let me get it. I just heard somebody's phone. I'm joking a little bit here. <laughs> so absence of threat. <laughs> the next one is, and these all, this is a whole course that I'm going through e easily, meaningful content. Today, as you came to this conference, with the fear that you're going to have to sit for hours, you kept asking yourself, it better be good. It better be good. We better get something we want. And you're saying, if, if it's not good, you're going to go, oh, you know, I have an appointment. I have to go home. So you and I are no different than the students. We want meaning in our life. We want something of substance in our life. And we can do that in the classroom. If we will believe the greatest learning environment in the world is outside the classroom. Outside the classroom. Think of all the things children learn by five. At home, in the yard, playing, in the creek, in the water. Learning is a natural phenomena. And then we come to school. And we tell them what time they're going to learn what, what papers they have to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The first thing a teacher needs to do every uh, month, once a month, is take the children somewhere in the city, somewhere in the country. This is what you need money. The minister shouldn't have left. You need money for buses. Because it is outside the school that children can ask questions. What's this? What does that do? How does that work? Show me. That's where you find mentors who can do something, who can lead the children into learning about wood, 
learning about how to make things, learning how to do business, learning how to do dry cleaning. It's not about going to technical schools eventually. It is about giving them experiences of seeing what real people do. I have one greatest happiness about coming to Slovakia this time. I haven't been here now for 15 years, and so I honor the fact that ITV still exists. But it's so colorful this time. When I was here last, it was all gray and gray and gray. It's colorful. But you know what made me sad? I can tell that the boys are bored. How do you think I know the boys are bored? Now notice I say boys, because I think it's boys. They're doing graffiti. Da, 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 da. Everywhere in your beautiful city. And I understand there's some legal places for graffiti, and there are some good, there's some good, but there's too much not good. And the not good are messages from the boys that there's nothing meaningful in their life. If the most important thing in their life is to make a line on a wall, something is terribly wrong. And so the challenge is, I was at a wonderful school, secondary school, and the children had just 15 years old, had just made a marvelous movie. Great, great director of the movie. And I challenged him. I said, you come up with a film about graffiti and how to build better characters out of these children who are, who are lost. I think they're lost. They have no meaning. And I said, I'll see that it's distributed around the world. It's not only your city that has it, but every time you look at these things that are just like this, it says, this boy has no meaning in his life. There's no project. There's nothing he can look up to. There's nothing he can build. So he gets a can of paint. Take a minute right now and just ask your neighbors, is this true or am I not right? Ask your neighbors about graffiti. Talk to your neighbor one minute. Teach them how to be artistic and spread the message of the beauty of Slovakia, of the great quotes of Slovakians, of times in your history that have made it wonderful. When I first came on my first conference and in honor of Comenius, Comenius, okay, Comenius, I know I read what he had written in 1400. And he said, give the children experiences. He knew then how to be ITV. He knew. And so that's where we are again now. The children need opportunities to see their world and see their place in their world. And I have to tell you from experience, my world is not my paper. My world is not my degree. It is not my university. It is none of that. My world is my experience. So meaningful content becomes critically important. The other thing is children need choices. We all need choices. Howard Gardner, 30 years ago, said we have multiple intelligences. Many. There are some artists. There are some um, movement people. There are some logical people. But we ha our brain has many ways to take information. And then children want to tell you how they understand that information. So we need choices. We need adequate time. Haven't you ever wished that you could stop the clocks? And so yesterday I said to my teachers that I spoke with yesterday, I said, if you want to teach multiplication, 
You can do it in two days. Because you know what you do for two days? You do multiplication. You do multiplication, you do multiplication, you do multiplication, you do multiplication. You do for two days and they have it. Two days. Takes one day to teach division. One day. And why would you teach these math skills quickly? Because you ha they're skills and children need them to understand science and social studies and reading. They need to be able to do the math attached to those things. So you get the skills over with the first week of school and you put it in their toolbox of skills and now they can use them all year long. So they don't have to ask the question, why do I have to learn this? When am I ever going to use this? You teach the skills the first week and they'll use them all year round. Doesn't that sound wonderful? And you go, sure. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Yes, it is possible. I met a third grade teacher who's going back into the third grade this year, and she said the curriculum is they have to know multiplication. They have to spend the whole year. So I'm sending her the program of how to do it in two days. And maybe at the next conference she can show everyone else. Because that's the power of the brain today. It can take us to places we never thought of before. So your first question would be, so is America perfect now in its schools? Well, I don't think so. I don't think so. In some of our schools, we have 14 to 25 different languages. Children coming from all over the world, different languages, very difficult. But we still do ITV to the best of our ability. So they need choices. They need to know how to work in cooperation, how to cooperate together. We just danced there, did you notice? OK, now I lost my thing again. Hang on. Okay. I'm going to put it around my neck. Uh, <laughs> they need immediate feedback. Let me just talk about immediate feedback for a minute. Say you did a paper. Say you did a paper, and you turned it in, and you're not, you're not sure how you did. And the teacher gets it back to you in two days. It doesn't matter in two days. It doesn't matter in two days. When you do an assignment, you give the assignment, and you walk around the class, and you see how they're doing. And you come up to my friend here, and you see that he's doing something differently. We don't say wrong. We say, oh, tell me what you're thinking. Uh, because I, I, we want our children to know they're always thinking. And so he tells me, amazing, amazing. Uh, you've helped me here, but may I help you here? And in four minutes, I'm going to reteach the lesson so that he can get the lesson that was intended. He gets feedback immediately. The hardest thing for the brain to unlearn is what they've learned wrong. The hardest thing to unlearn is what you've learned incorrectly. So you have to give immediate feedback as to whether or not it's right or wrong. Now, the good news is as the children go up in the grades, they can assess their own. They can assess their own. They can figure out their own. I watched a class do, a math class do something, and it was absolutely amazing what they did. And they were begging for homework. Please, please give us homework. Because they were so excited about what the teacher had done with mathematics. Now, what is mastery? Oh, uh, mastery is such a wonderful thing. To know if your students really understand anything, they have to be able to teach it to someone else. That's mastery. If that fourth grader can take what they learned and take it down to grade three and show a grade three person how to do it or a grade five person how to do it, they have mastered the understanding of whatever it is you have. It is in the reteaching it to someone else that the brain goes, ah, I got it. I got it. So that's the, that's the joy of all of this. This is the joy. Just a minute, I have to see what it says in English. <laughs> oh, yes, this is huge. Emotion is the gatekeeper to performance Let me, and learning. Here's your brain, all of your senses, and you know you have more than five. You have more than five. It was the priests 2,500 years ago that decided there were five because they could see them. 
eyes, nose, mouth, ears, touch. But there, there are, we say there's 19, there could be 30, but here's the wonderful thing about that. All that sensory input comes into a body and the body has to make a decision. All the input comes in and see this little person standing here? I call him the gatekeeper. He or she has to decide. There are two things they have to decide. Is it safe and predictable in this classroom? Is it safe and predictable? It has to be safe from their peers and safe from their teacher. If it is safe, the child can go, okay, I can go up here, and up here is where the learning happens that we're interested in. So it has to be safe and predictable. In an ITV classroom, there's an agenda on the wall that shows them exactly what they're going to be doing so they feel confident that the teacher knows what they're going to do. So here's what happens if it's not safe. If it's not safe, they downshift. Their blood pressure rises, and the boys become physical. They punch each other, hurt each other, say bad things to each other. Girls are mean. When girls are downshifted, girls are mean, and they'll do... They'll exclude other girls. So all, our, all of our efforts have to be concentrated on creating this safe and predictable environment. The heart's a very amazing thing. The heart instructs the brain what to do. The heart instructs the brain what to do. Because the heart has a rhythm that is much bigger than the rhythm of the brain. And sometimes when you have music, loud music, ah, it changes the rhythm of the heart. It changes the rhythm of the brain. When we have children come into the classroom, we have on music that takes the rhythm from whatever they had at recess down to about 72 beats per minute. We want that rhythm to be such that they can concentrate. So the heart's very important in all this. So why did we... Well, let me just... I, now I get ahead of myself sometimes. Um, <laughs> Here's my help, my helpers over here. Thank you. <clears throat> You're okay, I'm there. Let's see what happens. Let's just see what happens. Ah, uh, yeah. Here's one thing that people are talking about right now. They're talking about that now we have social media, so everything's gonna be fine. Did you find any station on television this morning that didn't talk about a war or people revolting or something down in the the mines in Turkey. We have social media, but it's bringing us more and more things that could be very distressing. So we have to build, we have to build attitude in schools. What's your attitude? And I have to tell you about my Italian mother. She stood about five foot tall, black curly hair, dark brown eyes. I'm the oldest of four. And she had rules, a lot of rules. So our rule was we had to be happy by breakfast. Did you get that translation? Okay, good. Just checking, just checking. So I thought, oh, you know, and I, I was about eight years old. Don't let me forget I put this here. Uh, I, I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go ask the neighbors. So I went to a neighbor. Do you have to be happy at breakfast? No. Mm. Does your family have to be happy? At, no. I, then on Sunday, I said to mother, we are the only ones who have to be happy at breakfast. Why do we have to be happy? And she looked at me with her beautiful brown eyes, and she said something I'll never forget. She said, Susan, you have to be happy because you have two eyes, two arms, and two legs, and you don't need anything else to be happy. So I say to teachers, did you come here on your own? Did you get through the traffic safely? Did you walk up those stairs? Did you look at the program? Did you shake hands with your friends? I love that everybody kisses here. Did you kiss a lot of people? You, we're happy already. doesn't matter whatever helps, happens this day. So my, our attitude at home was we had to be happy. We also had to answer the phone, good morning, good afternoon, I said, Mom, why do we have to do this? She says, it makes others feel better. Good morning, good afternoon. So it's your attitude. If I were to ask your spouse, 
your partner, your children, what your attitude is in the morning, what would they say? How do you greet your children? How do you greet your spouse? How do you set the tone for the day? Because it's critically important. You carry that with you. So you keep those things in mind. So your attitude, your at oh, there it is, there it is, thank you. Your attitude, it changes everything. It changes everything. I loved our moderator today. He brought joy to the opening of the program. He made the children relaxed. I liked when he went like this. He said, I'm going to be casual about this. He made our attitudes be, oh boy, this is going to be great. So how do we change attitudes? How do we change attitudes? These are the ways we can change attitudes, but I'm going to go on to the next screen because I want to get you there instead. I, I'm going to share with you the idea of something that we created uh, about 20 years ago. And we created... Um, when we went into traditional schools in, in the United States, there was big discipline plans. This is, a, this is good, this is bad, you give check marks. I didn't want to do that. So I said, what should we do, what should we create that would allow people to have an attitude that would make for good learning? So the first thing we did, we picked out things called lifelong guidelines, and there are five of them, and that's another workshop. But these five were what you needed to find a good spouse. The person has to be trustworthy. The person has to be truthful. They have to be actively listening to you. That works for about the first three months in a marriage. They have to not put you down, no put downs. And they have to be able to give you their personal best and want you to do your personal best. Do you wonder, do you have wonderings about why it is so dangerous to so many in this world that girls are getting an education? That you could kidnap 276 girls who are getting an education? That you could shoot a girl in the face who was on her way to school? What is the fear about girls getting an education? It frightens me. We take education for granted. Your girls take education for granted. Can you imagine if you would have acid thrown in your face because you wanted to learn? This is scary. So in this, we then went, after we got what we should get a spouse, then we went to, here are, here are some specific ways that we can talk to give people the language of a positive attitude. We don't say things like, that was good, that was nice. Ah, what does that mean, good and nice? But we say, that took courage. That took problem solving. Look at the, look at the initiative you used when you did that. If you give children these words and the words are attached to an action, they carry that with them for the rest of their life. I had a gentleman come up to me today at the uh, television studio who said, you know, I took the training 20 years ago and I still remember. And he, he got a little emotional about it because you see, you'll never forget attitude. You'll forget content. You'll forget content. You won't forget how you were treated. You will never forget it. That's why when I say, who is your best teacher? The first, the first response is usually, she cared about us. He cared about us. It's not about he was a great math teacher or a great social. He cared about us. It's a human condition. It's a human condition. So here's the challenge. Here, how do we build? How do we build capacity? How do we build the capacity to deal with the technological age? You use technology when it supports and enhances. You acknowledge that technology is, can work faster, but it's not better than people working together. It's not better than people working together. It's an amazing phenomena. And so what are some of these 21st century skills that you need? These are huge. What are you doing in your classrooms to build creativity? I live in California. I live near Silicon Valley. I've lived in Washington next to Microsoft. The bottom line is brilliance. Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg were geniuses, both of which 
who did not leave, who left college, left the university, because there was nothing there for them. So you have students in your classroom who have an opportunity to be creative. Are you letting them have that opportunity? So when the minister's uh, spokesperson came and said, well, the teachers want the government to create the curriculum, never. Let them create the standards and benchmarks. Let the teacher learn how to make learning come alive in their classrooms. Let the teachers learn something about how this wonderful country works. The teachers have to stand up as a learned person and be excited about where we live and what we do. That's the secret of the 21st century. In addition to that, you have to have innovation. You have to have innovation. What can you do differently that you were not doing last week or last month? It's that sense of, oh my gosh, that's where I'll put my third eye. It's about innovating, looking at ways to do things differently. That's profound. That's profound. And most of all, you have to have community. You have to know how to work with people, work with people. It's not always easy to compromise, but it is always powerful to see what somebody else is thinking. So the 21st century technology, yeah, I got my phone. You're not going to believe this. This is truly something that happened. I paid extra money so that I could call Europe home. <laughs> the other night, I pressed the wrong button. I have disabled my phone. So this phone now is pretend because it's not working. And so we're working on how to fix it. But the challenge is, is that the phone doesn't work, but there are still people I can talk to. And so I have enjoyed and loved my ability to talk with you today. Thank you very much. Susan. Slovakian voice right here. A v podstate ja viem, že je prestávka. Už beží prestávka veľká, už sa prechádzame do okola a máme desiatu. Aj napriek tomu jedna, jedna otázka. A... Susan, počas prestávky, viete, mnoho nápadov tu bežalo, mnoho všelijakých vecí a predstav, či už rodiča, učiteľa, ako robiť a pracovať s deťmi? Yes. Môžem prísť za vami, alebo za pedy, alebo za kýmkoľvek z vás a opýtať sa vás čokoľvek, čo, čo sa chcem opýtať, čo mi nie je jasné? also have it at the school uh, when we go to the school today and tomorrow. <laughs> Somebody's got to put something in check. Slova. Takisto budú workshopy dneska po obede a potom zajtra, kde budú vysvetlené rôzne idei a všetky tie myšlienky, ktoré boli aj prezentované tu. And we want, I want to thank all the sponsors of this conference. Uh, Bill Gates, Uh, and Melinda Gates have done amazing things in the world for all people. And so I think Microsoft has been an incredible gift to the world. So Stephen Jobs too. <laughs> <laughs> okay.